I mentioned that uh, today I will talk about uh, path path model. If you remember, in uh, writing the quas, in discussing the Parton model, I introduced the function f of x, which is probability of finding a Parton. with momentum fraction x but if we are talking about quark part on model we know that there are at least two types of quarks. I mean, by the way, deep inelastic scattering is done with protons and neutrons. Or okay, protons and nuclei, but nuclei consist of protons and neutrons. And uh, in protons and neutrons, we know that there are at least two types of quarks. So we can't just introduce one function we should introduce at least two functions. So for protons, we introduce up of x and dp of x. up of x is probability of Finding a U quark in proton with momentum fraction x and similarly for dp of x. And in the case of neutrons, we Similarly, introduce and uh, we sort of if we interchange the protons if we interchange the up quarks in proton with down quarks and down quarks in proton with up quarks we get a neutron so we can say that up of x is equal to dp of x or rather dn of x i'll call u of x and uh, dp of x is equal to dn of x however we see we will see very soon that this leads to an inconsistency seems like a very simple picture but it will lead to an inconsistency inconsistency because mm, yeah we have Proton has isospin half. So 
we can have just one minute Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, this is uh, not isospin, but projection of isospin. The I three because isospin you have to add vectorially, but projection of isospin is a scalar and that we simply add. So that for proton is half and for up quarks it is half and for down quarks it is minus half. Right. On the other hand, if I charge also simply adds and for proton charge is equal to 1, 0 to 1 dx. For a quarks, the charge is 2 by 3. And for down quarks, it is minus 1 by 3. And <laughs> these two equations, can they be made consistent? Well, I have integral okay we can make them consistent u of x minus d of x is equal to 1 and integral 0 to 1 to u of x minus d of x is equal to This says a minus b is equal to 1. This means 2a minus b is equal to 3. So if I subtract this from this, I have okay, I have a equal to 2 and b equal to 1. Yeah, uh, okay, actually these are consistent. Sorry, I made a wrong statement earlier. So, this is a simple picture we can have that there are only up quarks and down quarks and uh, they satisfy these relations. And so we introduce only two functions, u of x and d of x. And uh, isospin equation is given by this, charge equation is given by this, and uh, <coughs> they are consistent with each other. And we can derive lot more such equations. However, so
in the actual part part on model things are written in a slightly more complicated way so we say that proton consists of a quarks and there are up quarks and anti up quarks down quarks anti down quarks and strange quarks and anti strange quarks and similarly in the case of neutron Why do we strange? Yeah. And why why do we bring in the strange quarks in proton? And why not bigger ones? Okay. Uh, the answer to that is uh, slightly complicated, but not very complicated. Uh, basically, I mean the. important justification for quark model quark pattern model comes from qcd and in qcd there is a scale which which is called lambda qcd the the lambda qcd scale is as i said it's a scale so it's not an exact number so in your calculations you can take it to be 100 mev somebody else will take it to be 150 somebody else will take it to be 200 mev but it's a number let's say between 100 to 300 mev this lambda qcd and uh, the assumption people make is that any quark whose mass is comparable to this lambda qcd can appear as a parton but quarks whose masses are much larger than lambda qcd their appearance is suppressed by something like exponential minus mass of the quark by lambda qcd so if you are talking about up quark and down quark whose masses are supposed to be mev so you have exponential minus mev by 200 which is essentially exponential zero that's of num order 1 whereas in the case of strange quark it is e power minus 1 which is 1 over e so that's like uh, some 10% 20% kind of number but if you are talking about cham quark whose mass is about 1.4 gb so you have e power minus 7 and that's a negligibly small number so that is why in the quark pattern model people consider up down and strange quarks but not heavier ones but mind you nowadays there are some so called anomalies in b meson decays so people are trying to test 
are these anomalies really there what is happening is you look at the decays of b mesons and something which is not expected in standard model is happening rather there is an imbalance standard model predicts an inequality but that equality is not observed which means there is some there may be some new physics so there are small number of people who are looking at it from lhc point of view lhc has this 10 power 10 proton bunches interacting with each other so even though exponential mass of b by lambda it's like uh, 10 power minus 100 so very small number but you can have the the sheer number of collisions in lhc is so large that maybe there are a few collisions where you can probe the b quark in the proton and then you ask okay and that b quark undergoes this strange interaction and what is the consequence of that so in a typical quark parton model people talk about up down and strange but there are situations people do consider uh, charm quark content of the proton and uh, bottom quark content of the proton also Uh, mm. so we need to normalize these u huh. these b these functions yeah so that uh, total uh, huh. momentum is carried by all no, the no 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 momentum is coming later but i mean they first they have to set so we assume that number of up quarks in proton are two which means that integral up minus u bar p and similarly integral and for s it will be zero because strangeness of proton is zero okay, so there are certain strangeness violating the case yeah. some so those mesons will have imbalance of no 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 I mean, we are talking about protons and uh, neutrons. We are not talking of any mesons. We are talking about quark content of proton and neutron. And uh, yes, I mean, by the strange mesons decay by violating strangeness. And there is a further uh there is a further definition that is made this up is written as up balance affects plus up c affects so and uh, whereas u bar p of x is purely the c so me mentally we can think of this whole 
set of power terms those which are I mean this is purely our accounting device we call them valence and it is those valence ones which contribute to this relation and which means that the c part of protons the c, the c <laughs> c quarks the the uptight c quarks should density should be equal to the anti uptight c quark density c c a huh c s c a c no yeah c s e a c or the picture is like a dirac c there are all these c of particles they are all real or virtual they are real in the sense that we see the effect of them in the deep inelastic scattering they they are the ones which cause deep inelastic scattering so putting this here we say that 0 to 1 up valence of x dx is equal to 2 and and you can make similar definitions for the down type quarks in proton and the c quarks in proton and make similar definitions for neutron also but we are interested in again we will go back to that function f of x that we introduced earlier and if you remember we related it to both f1 of x and f2 of x which led to this uh, relation f2 of x is equal to 2x f1 of x which was also was equal to i derived this equation i think in the two classes ago it's called callan gross relation and remember this f1 of x and f2 of x are functions which are coming in the differential cross section which means that there were some matrix elements which got square and those matrix elements the square of those matrix elements are what contributed to f2 of x and f1 of x so if i have an up quark in proton and it is participating in deep inelastic scattering of an electron there will be a factor 2 by 3 whole square sitting in front so if i want to write f2 of proton here we see that if there is just one kind of parton of unit charge then f2 of x is x times f of x but if there are two kinds of partons and one with charge 2/3 and the other with charge minus 1/3 then f2 of proton will be 
four nights u p of x plus u bar p of x plus one ninth b p of x plus b bar p of x plus one ninth s of x plus s bar p of x. Is that okay? Uh, sorry, there should be an x in front. F2 is x times fx. So, and similarly, f2, f2 n of x will have a similar expression in terms of u n, u bar n, etc. etc. The x. Hmm? It should be there in all the terms. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. By the way, uh, Cheng and Lee, dis they discuss a lot of some rules and uh, another thing I haven't yet discussed the so-called F functions for neutrino deep inelastic scattering and they discuss them also and they do a lot of manipulations of those functions. But the most important quantity we consider is momentum sum so x is the momentum fraction so we must have x times u p of x plus u bar p of x plus d p of x plus d bar p of x I guess we should include the s also Yeah, obviously, plus S P of X plus S bar P of X integral zero to one dx is equal to one. Hmm. You agree? x times u p of x is the fraction of the momentum carried by the up quarks in the proton and this is the up anti quarks in the proton etc and summed over I should get 1 and I can, I also have
same thing should hold for neutrons also. Now we make the assumption which is based on isospin that un of x is equal to dp of x. and we make the corresponding assumptions for the anti quartz also if you do that we have the following relations um just a minute No, actually, I don't, do I need these relations? That's what I'm trying to. Yeah, I do need these relations. Yeah. Anyway, well, if I make this assumption, then both these equations are saying the same thing. And what this equation is saying is I'm going to split things into two parts. There is a reason why I have done this, but this first equation, anyway, these two equations under this assumption, both these equations say the same thing and that equation I have written it as integral over the up and up quark and up anti quark and then the rest of it. Why did I do that? That is because of 
these F2 functions is four nines u of x plus u bar of x plus one nine d of x plus b bar of x plus s of x plus s bar of x. Whereas F two N is four nines D of X plus D bar of X plus one nine Oh, by the way, I should, there is a X in front, I should remember that. So, the basic point is that This F2 of P is one linear combination of U and D and F2 of N is a different linear combination of U and D. So, if yeah. I... Huh? Yeah? You have 4 by 9 there because it's 2 by 3 squared. Yeah. 2 by 3 is the charge of U. Quartz. Right. But here it is... The up quark in neutron, which I am equating to down quark in proton. U n of x I have is equal to d p of x, which I have defined as d of x. So that's what. Okay. So that d of x is actually it, u of this is the down quark density in proton. proton. So I mean I have I have made those assumptions. So the basic point here is that this is one linear combination of u and d. And this is a different linear combination of U and D. So I can write I can write U plus U bar. I can cancel the rest of things out and I can get some U plus U bar. And similarly, I by taking appropriate linear combinations here, I can get U plus U bar and D plus D bar. But I'm a little bothered about the S here and let me just see. Huh. Yeah. The reason why we do not bother about S is the because of the following. There is an x sitting here. 
which means that the contribution to these integrals in the region where x is small the contribution to the integral is small so and this is one of the assumptions of quark parton model that s quark is purely a c quark and c quark density is dominant only at small x at larger values of x the c quark density falls off significantly so because of that we ignore the the <laughs> Only for small x the c quark densities are large at uh, x greater than 0.1 or so the c quark densities are very small so the contribution of the c quarks to the momentum sum rule is quite small so draw with that we see that integral 0 to 1 f2px is equal to 4 by 9 integral 0 to 1 ux plus u bar x times x dx plus 19 integral whereas integral 0 to 1 f2 nx is 19 integral 0 to 1 ux plus u bar x no sorry what i have wrote it wrongly four by nine dx d bar x and one ninth dx plus d bar x. So you call this quantity some a. and you call this quantity sum b and
yeah and moment of sum rule is stating that a plus b should be equal to 1 but we see that 4a plus b is equal to 9 times integral 0 to 1 f2 p x dx and uh, 4b plus a is equal to 9 times integral 0 to 1 f2 mx dx. So I have a pair of linear equations in a and b. I solve for a and b add the two and see whether this constraint is satisfied or not. This f2 of p of x is something I can measure in the lab. Similarly, f2 n of x I cannot directly measure. What I can measure is f2 of deuterium. Neutron decays, a free neutron decays with a lifetime of about 10 minutes. So I can't do experiments with free neutrons. I can't do deep and elastic scattering experiments with free neutrons. But what I can do is do deep and elastic scattering with, <coughs> with uh, deuterium and say that deuterium F2 is F2P plus F2N because I mean at the kinematic regime of the deep and elastic scattering you are not only probing inside the nucleus you are even probing inside the constituents of the nucleus so you can make the approximation that f2 of deuterium is f2p plus f2n from which you extract f2n so this right hand side is a measurable quantity, this right hand side is also a measurable quantity. So from these two, I get A and B and ask what is the value for A plus B. And so to write it a little more formally, The explicit prediction that you simply get by adding the two equations. So this is about 0.55 if the momentum sum rule is correct but experiment shows that this LHS is 0.28 that is half the predicted value. 
So, what is carrying the other half of the momentum? So, straightforward answer. Well, remember that this F2 is measured in deep elastic scattering involving electrons. So, only charged partons contribute to this. So, the assumption then is that there are neutral partons in the proton and it is the neutral partons which are carrying half the momentum. And within QCD, those neutral partons are what we call gluons. By the way, I should also mention that there is something called proton spin problem, which is a still unsolved problem. So here, till here, we are summing over all spins. But I can try to do scattering of polarized electrons on polarized protons so that I can try to probe the spin of these partons. And in Gelman quark model, the spin of the proton is coming purely due to the quarks. But if you try to estimate the spin of the proton in quark parton model the way we have done and compare it with experiment by writing something called the spin sum rule. We have written a momentum sum rule here. We try to write what we call a spin sum rule. Then instead of getting half we get zero. The spin sum rule predicts that some experimentally measured quantity should be equal to half, which is the expectation that proton spin is half. But when you actually measure the, that experimental quantity, you get zero. The, not quite 0 0.1 or something. So, this was a big problem. Does it mean that proton spin is purely due to gluons? If it is purely due to gluons, how can you have spin half? Because gluons are spin half particles. One. Sorry, spin one particles. So, there is this proton spin problem is still a problem with us and we don't quite we don't have a solution for it and uh, so mind you this problem originally came up in uh, sometime in late 1980s so that is more than 30 years ago and uh, all the data that has been taken since then has not been successful in throwing any light on this proton spin problem. So in that sense, the proton spin, I mean, if you read Cheng and Lee, he sort of talks in a somewhat uh, overall picture and he says that yes, okay, in quark parton model, we are making all these assumptions and uh, they are all verified by the experiment. Okay. Momentum sum rule is not verified, but then you say, okay, but there is QCD and in QCD there are quarks and gluons. So the fact that momentum sum rule is not verified, half the momentum is carried by gluons. So that's how you can account for it. But uh, how do we account for quark? the proton spin. So in that sense, the proton spin does not fit the simple quark parton model picture 
that I have built here. And people have been building more and more complicated pictures that uh, somehow quark orbital angular momentum and uh, gluon spin somehow they combine to give you something. So picture is being made more and more complicated but as far as I know there is no satisfactory solution to proton spin problem in uh, for, there is no satisfactory solution to proton spin problem in quark quark transform. Proton spin has spin half. Yeah. But quark proton model expects spin to be zero. No, 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 no. As I said, there is a see. Let's see what we have done here. We assume that the quarks are carrying all the momentum of the proton. Based on which we made this prediction. Left hand side is an experimentally measured quantity. And the quark parton model under the assumption that quarks carry all the momentum predicts this experimentally measured quantity to be 0.55 but experimental measurement shows it to be 0.28 so obvious implication quarks are carrying only half the momentum of the proton what is carrying the other half answer okay we are talking in the context of QCD so other half of the momentum is carried by gluons that's the answer given. Fine, you accept that answer. Now, you do a polarized experiment, an experiment with polarized electrons, polarized proton, and you probe and you ask that, okay, the orbital angular momentum quarks are moving around in the proton so they can have orbital angular momentum but our orbital angular momentum is an integer quantity gluon spin is one that is also integer quantity so naively you say okay orbital angular momentum of proton of orbital angular momentum of quarks will not contribute to pro proton spin gluons don't contribute to proton spin only quark spins contribute to proton spin. You make a naive assumption like that. Based on that assumption, you derive the so-called spin sum rule, which predicts another experimental quantity to be half. But when that experimental quantity was measured in 1988 or so, answer came out to be 0.1 which means that quarks are not carrying the quark spin is not responsible for proton spin so then people started building these complicated pictures that okay some part of it is coming from orbital angular momentum some part of it is coming from gluons and picture is now very very complicated and to the best of my knowledge there is no satisfactory solution in the low energy uh, west hmm. frame hmm. Uh, kelman model with three quarks and there it is the spin of the quarks which is responsible for the spin of the proton there is no confusion there so does the spin of the proton change at high high energy? So, I mean this quark parton model is what you would call a shotgun marriage. Two completely incompatible things you are forcing them together. So, see then, there is model and there is the quote physics, what is happening in physics what is actually happening 
so it's just the gelman's model is one model quark parton model is another model so i mean if you are are you saying that if i if i take both models seriously then i have to say that yes the proton spin is change it is half at low energies and it is 0.1 at high energies but uh, as i told you quark parton model does not give a complete picture of proton spin at least that is what i believe so all i can say is lot more work has to be done and we have to develop a deeper understanding in the uh, gelman model mm. low energies or proton at rest mm. we have uh, three quarks yeah uh, we don't have gluons like do we have gluons or are the gluons virtual Uh, i'll ask some more and then come yeah no 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 i mean the, today, uh, the physics content of today's lecture is done so you can ask all the questions the, i mean next step is up in uh, on thursday's lecture i will talk about within quark parton model we do neutrino deep inelastic scattering and see what it predicts and in particular it makes this famous prediction that neutrino cross section is three times the anti neutrino cross section which is experimentally verified so so the we the thing is in gelman's model <laughs> which is valid when your probe has very low energy and the momentum transfer involved is essentially zero whereas here the momentum transfer is very high it's deep in elastic so i mean one thing we have learned from quantum field theory especially from qcd is the properties of a system are very sensitive to the probe that you are using so I mean that certainly is true, but I mean I, not only I but lot of people don't like the idea that the proton spin depends on. I mean proton spin is a quantized; it's not a continuous variable, so to speak. It's something quantized. so i mean that changing with the probe and becoming a continuous variable that is not acceptable to lot of people so i don't think anybody is actually saying that uh, the proton spin is changing with the energy of the probe and that's why i'm say i told you that people are trying to build very complicated models to keep the proton spin half uh, can i ask like this yeah uh, in the gelman model we have three quarks mm. okay so now we have a proton at rest sitting mm. here and now we go to another yeah. frame where we are moving very fast yeah but again you should talk not in terms of proton at rest and proton moving you should talk in terms of the energy of the probe in gelman model is describing proton mass proton charge and proton magnetic moment and how do you measure proton magnetic moment you measure it with very low energy for photons whereas in deep inelastic scattering you are probing the proton with very virtual but very high energy photons so 
I mean, people are trying to, they don't want to give up, there is no attempt at giving up Lorentz invariance. So, proton spin at rest is half and proton spin, even if it is moving with uh, essentially speed of light, then also its spin is half. They try to preserve that. Not just spin, I mean, it looks like the number of particles also changes as we go from one frame to another. At rest, it seems like there are three particles. Huh. Think... Yeah, but as I said, uh, at rest, the probe is sense sees three particles, but I mean, a low energy probe sees three particles, but a high energy probe sees many particles. Yes, that is what is happening. It's it's not a comfortable situation, I most definitely agree. We have similar problem for the well, so far nobody has, there has been no measurement of a neutron spin. Because that's not an easy measurement to make because in a deuteron, the spins of proton and neutron are correlated. So, the F2 F2 of deuteron we can write as F2 of proton plus F2 of neutron, but we can't quite do that with the deuteron. So measuring the the corresponding new is whether there is a neutron spin problem. I don't think the corresponding measurements are available. Okay, so we'll meet at uh, 10 o'clock on uh, Thursday for the last lecture where I will do the calculation of uh, deep elastic scattering of neutrinos on what we'll call an isoscalar target. So in neutrino scattering, we always talk about isoscalar targets that is with equal number of protons and neutrons. And, uh, and there we will see that the neutrino scattering cross section turns out to be three times the anti-neutrino scattering cross section which has very important implications for neutrino experiments. So this three uh, factor, mm. this model uh, does predict that? The three factor actually comes from angular momentum conservation, but uh, of course it basically is because, I, I mean, let's say neutrino is left chiral and if we take these quarks and these quarks here and we will assume that only the so-called valence quarks are important, we will ignore the C quarks. And the in a proton or a neutron, the valence quarks are quarks, so they are also left-handed as far as the weak interaction is concerned. So you have two left-handed particles coming like this. So their net net spin is zero. So there is no restriction in the directions in which they can go the after the interaction uh, it, the distribution is isotropic but 
anti neutrino is right handed so its spin it is moving like this but its spin is like this then the i can write it on the board So this is a quark which is left handed, this is a neutrino which is also left handed. So after scattering they can go in any direction. But this is quark which is left handed, this is anti neutrino which is right handed. So the spin projection is like this which means that if after scattering the particles go like this i have to take the particles going like this and take the spin projections on this and match the angular momentum and when i do that when i do that matching i get that one third factor So, the only quark parton model aspect that we will use is that proton consists of these partons which are left handed quarks and neutron consists of partons which are left handed quarks. That is the only thing we use. The it, there is and of course there are I mean we also use the fact that it's an isoscalar target so there are equal number of up quarks and equal number of down quarks